We still have another bail. All right. How you doing? Good. So how's the war on terror? Christmas is always potentially our busy season. So, Bill Leotardo, huh? Coronary? I swear to God, I had nothing to do with that. Just so you know, I'm, uh, I'm still in touch with some agents who work OC. From what they hear, you're not very popular in Brooklyn right now. So what else is no? That someone close to you may be in danger. Really? Anybody specific? All they know is uh, it's under serious discussion at top levels. Thanks. It's Christmas. You know, folks, every time I hear that or watch that scene and hear that last line, it's one of the best lines in the series. And the gentleman who said that is with us today. He's done a number of things. I remember first watching him on One Life to Live. He played uh, the dirty cop, Nick Manzo. He's had a tremendous career since, but we will always know him affectionately as uh, detect, uh, Agent Dwight Harris on the hit show, The Sopranos, which he played all seven seasons on, and he plays a pivotal role in the uh, final season. It's my honor to introduce to you the one and only Matt Servito. And Matt, this is a real pleasure for me, and I really thank you for coming on today. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, always love to uh, talk about uh, what is fondly referred to. Uh, just so you know, those in the know will never call The Sopranos The Sopranos. It's called The Show. Hey, I saw you on the show. I love the show. The show was amazing. These guys, I've learned over the years, they've never referred to it by name. So I'm letting you in already on a little little intel that'll make you super cool. Just well, we're it. gonna we're gonna get to that very soon, and what a show it was. But Matt, um, if I remember correctly, uh, you went to Notre Dame High School in Harper Woods, Michigan, yes. and um, initially you did only musicals in high school. And I think it was uh, you uh, did West Side Story, and that's when you said you want to be an actor. So just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I was growing up in Detroit, um, really with. Uh, almost no interest in in acting at all. I just really um, I went to an all boys uh, prep school, and the only thing we did officially with our sister school was plays, the musicals. And uh, I had just finished my freshman year football uh, team. You know, we just finished our, our fall schedule, and I, I didn't have anything on the docket. And I see sign goes up, school musical West Side Story. And that was our school. And there, uh, and so three other all girls schools were going to audition to come to our school and be in the, the show. And I was uh, kind of like, "Wait a minute!" So <laughs> all they, they're all coming here. I went home. I said to my dad, "I said we're doing this musical West Side Story." I thought that was just a movie because my dad loved that show. He used to whenever it was on. This is back when you had to kind of, you know, schedule like there. Oh, hey, West Side Story is going to be on Sunday night, eight o'clock on Channel Seven. We'd all sit and watch it. Uh, so I knew all the music and I loved that he used to play the record of the soundtrack. So he said, oh, you should go out for it. I'm like, I guess. I mean, I'd never really done any acting, any singing or anything, but I knew I did know all the songs. I went out, auditioned, got a part of one of the Sharks. It's funny because my school was a lot of Irish guys and a lot of Italian guys. So all the Italians were Puerto Rican. All the Irish played uh, the Jets. And um, we had a blast. We had the time of our lives. And I was like, this I love. I mean, it was just uh, so many great people that I am still to this day very, very friendly with. And uh, I just fell in love with being on stage and fell in love with musicals. Now, cut to years later, I go all the way through high school. And by the time I moved on to college, I really was looking at serious drama schools. Though that was never my intention. It just sort of, I realized like there's musical theater training and then there is, uh, you know, theater and uh, television film training and and nary will the two ever cross kind of thing and um, for example my wife is musical theater she went to syracuse university studied exclusively uh, i think she got a degree in musical theater so um yeah unfortunately i i sort of um once i that i did all the high school musicals uh i moved on to you know the the, the heavy drama stuff and really have rarely ever looked back and so it's still still on my bucket list to get on broadway i don't even care if i'm singing you know, if I'm in, in the chorus with with uh, the, da the dancing girls, I'm, 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 I'll do it. Right. And if I remember correctly, Matt, um, when you went to Juilliard, um, I forget what guy had told you this, but he had told you that uh, he 
you seem like a passionate person, a diamond in the rough, but like you're just all over the place. So initially it took some time, but um, he definitely saw something in you right away. Yeah, I mean, I came there, you know, as a, a kid from, you know, the east side of Detroit. I was born in, just so just so I can clarify, I think on my IMDb it says I was born in Teaneck, New Jersey, and I was. I have lots of family in Jersey. My mother's from Jersey, uh, but I was raised in Detroit. Uh, we moved when I was right. little, where my father's from. Um, so, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, I was definitely kind of rough uh, when I got to uh, Juilliard. I'd had a couple of years of undergrad uh, at Wayne State University in Detroit uh, with some amazing teachers. And I was doing better, but still I was a young kid, raw uh, energy. And um, I, I, I know I got into the school probably more for passion than finesse. Um, so many people I know had amazing auditions to get into places like Juilliard, Yale, NYU, Carnegie Mellon, Boston Conservatory, all these great, great schools, Yale. Uh, but they, um, um, yeah, I, I got there and I, I, I immediately was getting my butt kicked and, uh, but I, I wanted to, I wanted, I, I, I'm like, look, come at me, man. I, I went for broke when I went audition for Juilliard. I figured, all right, let's just find the, the what are the top schools in the country? And right. I'm new, um, uh, so I, I had a short list and, um, I didn't want to finish undergrad in Detroit. I wanted to get out and start already kind of getting to places like California, Chicago, New York, and, um. Uh, so I auditioned for Juilliard, North Carolina School of the Arts, uh, was accepted there on a full ride. Uh, amazing program. And at that time, an excellent, like one of the top in the country. And a lot of great uh, actors and actresses came out of that program in the 80s. Uh, but um, at the last second, I got a, I was put on a wait list for Juilliard. I, I auditioned, auditioned well. I was on a wait list. And at the last minute, they accepted me for uh, the class we started in 1985. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it took, it, it, they really did. Uh, you know, they did their job and they beat the crap out of me. That's kind of the, what at that time was the Juilliard mentality. We're going to beat the crap out of you, then rebuild you into a much better actor. Get rid of all your bad habits, all of your your dialect, your 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 awful Midwestern nasally sounds, and make you a, a, a protean actor. You can go in any situation and take on an accent, take on a physicality, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, you know, you talked about uh, different people that came out of that school. Didn't, uh, I think, a Laura Lindney, didn't she go to that school as well? Or Oh, geez, we, we'll, be, we'll be here all night if I start going through the alumni. Laura was yeah. just, Laura was in the class behind me, along with Gene Triplehorn, Jake Weber, uh, right. Tim Blake Nelson. Uh, in my class was John Benjamin Hickey, Bill Camp, Jane Adams, Lisa Gay Hamilton, um, yeah. Howard Kay, so many great people. And then just before me, I'm just trying to think... Um, like uh uh like brad whitford got out just before uh, kevin spacey uh but the, some of the early classes i mean jesus mandy patinkin uh kevin klein patty lapone bill hurt robin williams uh chris Re christopher reeves um uh, most recently viola davis adam oh, Johnson, yeah. jessica chastain it this the school is kind of insane that it keeps uh producing at that at that level um i mean because it just uh, it, 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 cause it, it, it still only uses the auditioning process as a way to, you know, find people. And that is a very, uh, difficult process because you can fool people for a couple of days that you're a really good actor. Um, but the fact that they keep kind of finding people and, um, they, they again, you know, produce such amazing, uh, people with technique, people that are artists, people that are thinkers. So, um, and I feel that way about a lot of other programs too. NYU, I have so many friends that went there and, and teach there now. And, uh, so yeah, it, it, it really is. It was not, that program is not for everybody because it really can break you down. And if they don't build you up in time, you can get out of that school <laughs> damaged goods. But, uh, many people have gotten out and done very, very well. Right. Now back to high school, just a little bit, you had mentioned you played football and I believe you played varsity football. Now, Michigan is a big football you know, town, as you know, um, was football big when you were playing? I mean, was it big for your high school? Were you a big sports fan there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that conference that I played in, which was the, the, uh, Catholic league in the Detroit area, uh, big programs, Catholic central brother rice, Notre Dame. Um, yeah, we, we produced plenty of, um, players that went on to D one programs, um, and played also D two, D three in the state of Michigan. So, um, yeah, I always tell people like that was it was fierce, and I was captain of the team 
my freshman year because I was this big as a freshman. And by my senior year, I was just coming off the bench. I mean, I played special teams and stuff, but because the rest of the guys got huge yeah, and built, and built themselves up. And I'm like, I'm never playing another down football after I walk out of the school. And these guys were graduating with like no necks and like yeah. 280, 280 benching 380. I'm like, oh my God. But uh, I love football. It's still like more than anything. It's uh, it taught me a lot of life lessons, which is you get knocked down, you get back up, you get in the huddle. There's nothing it that that just simplifies everything in your entire life. You get knocked down, you get up, and you get back in the huddle. So it's not just getting up, but getting back in the huddle means like come back to your people, get with you know the others that give you strength, and and you go on to the next play. And I can't tell you how many times I was concussed, concussed. I'm sure I, I mean, back then we got concussed a lot and I was a lineman. And if you didn't, weren't having concussions every game, you weren't trying hard. Um, and literally being in the huddle just was seeing stars and ready to throw up. And my teammates are holding me up and they drag me back to the line and we hold the line again. And um, I love the camaraderie. I love the, 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 you know, the passion for the game. Um, and I've tried, definitely have instilled my love for sports to my kids as well. Right. And I was thinking about it too, Matt, you were probably either a senior or you just were out of high school when that great Detroit Tigers team won the world series in 84. Were you a fan of them or were you not a big baseball fan? Oh, are you talking to a former plot employee of the Detroit Tigers in 1984? Oh, uh, you were. I was, okay. I was a freshman in college at Wayne state university. And, uh, I went to a ton of games that year. I was always a Tigers fan. My dad was a Tigers. Yeah. I went to the 68. I was, a little boy in my dad's arms at the 1968 World Series when Detroit beat St. Louis in, in, in seven games. Uh, and it was a privilege and an honor to go back during 84. One of my buddies in college, his uh, one of his fraternity brothers, his dad ran security at the stadium, so he got us all jobs uh, working security, which was a term for stand, stand in the stands with like a jacket that says security, but don't get involved because there's tons of police around. So we just had to stand there and look tough. Uh, I'm an actor. I can act tough. Um, and I got to see all those games in person after they won. I had access to the stadium. I, I went up to the roof of the old stadium with my buddy and just looked down on the crowds down below. Truly a, a magical, magical team, a magical summer and uh, the time of my life. Yeah. And you talk about their fans. Their fans were always loyal because uh, Sparky Anderson always told a great story that the owner told him, all you got to do is win one time here, one time, and these fans will love you forever. And he probably managed another 10 years. They didn't win again, and those fans loved him. I mean, oh. that's all. That's how loyal those fans were to yeah. the people that put on that uniform. I think so many of those Midwestern towns, you know, Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, you know, Minnesota, Pittsburgh, you put a winner out there just once or twice. Yeah, they'll, you, you've got, you'll get 10, you just bought yourself 10 years. Because, you know, they're also knowledgeable fans. They know it's not easy to repeat. We tried. 85 was not good. We didn't get back till 87. We got back into the playoffs. Yeah. This is also back before the wild card and all that nonsense. I mean, you had to win your division. Yeah. There were four which I still wish. Which I still wish. I know. I love it. I, yeah. yeah. I, I I did. I was, I'm still a bit of a purist. But, um, yeah, it, uh, it it really, you know, I I, I – Truly, it's it, it's hard because then Detroit had all those great teams in 2012, 2013 with Maggie Odonez, Cabrera, yeah. uh, Max Scherzer pitching, Justin Verlander pitching, yeah. uh, Pudge Rodriguez behind the plate. So we had another great run. That was a few good years, to, twice back to the World Series. So believe me, man, I, I'm I'm an absolute huge fan of baseball, huge fan of the Tigers. And um, uh, I've always had a hard time rooting for the Lions because I'm not a fan of the ownership. Um, and they have been uh, mediocre. My, as you said, one win. We have, we don't have one. Lions have none. Yeah. You have to go back to the fifties when, before the Super Bowl, the Lions won the NFL championship multiple times. But yeah. in the Super Bowl era, we've never gone, and we're one of only, I think, two teams to never. And go. I think the guy, you know, it's funny we're talking about sports, but the guy that I think has to feel so validated now is Wayne Fonts because they tried to get on that guy all the time, and guess what? He probably had one of the best winning percentages when he was that coach. They went to two NFC championships. So looking back on it all, those fans, you know, back then they felt like a change was needed, but they probably say now, you know what, we didn't realize what we had till it was gone. Yeah. I mean, listen, but I, I still remember the Millen Man March. Um, Matt oh, Millen yeah. was our GM. I mean, you know, so it, it yes. I mean, Fonts, Fonts might have been the best of these terrible coaches and, 
we've just had a long line of bad coaches and bad quarterbacks. Uh, yeah. like, and then I, it was, I loved, I was so rooting for Stafford in the Super Bowl yeah. a couple of years ago because I just, I knew he was good enough. We just, the Lions, it's the same thing with Barry Sanders. They never put the team in front of Barry Sanders and they never put the team in front of Stafford to win a championship. You don't have the block. One year we'd have good defense, terrible offense. One year, great offense. We're just like Megatron throwing all the lighting it up, and we have no defense. We're lo- we're losing games forty two to forty. So we're capable of scoring, you know. But the Lions have just never in my lifetime put it together. It drives me insane. I I care that they win or lose only because my family and friends in Michigan care. But I I truly am I'm a, so neutral that I I I can spend a Sunday. My it's not ruined by their loss or win or maybe any better by their winning. Yeah, definitely. So while you were at Juilliard, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, um, you were doing all my children during the day and then going to Juilliard at night. Um, so talk about that a little bit, because that doesn't always happen. So talk about that. Yeah. So somewhere around the end of your fourth year at Juilliard, you do what's called your uh, league presentations or your presentations. So we did um, short scenes, acting scenes in our th- theater space uh, for agents, casting directors, and uh, producers and uh i was very lucky to get signed with an agency and then um so i the, but i was hired immediately this the, all my children which literally shoots across the street from juilliard that's where all the abc soaps all my children one life to live general hospital was in la uh but those two soaps and loving back in the day if you have a memory for oh, that yeah. loving yeah. came on at 12 30. Um, they all shot right there on 66th street, Juilliard's on 66th street. They needed me immediately. So basically I got a, like a, you know, a waiver from Juilliard that I could go. Um, um, I was shooting all my children during the day and then coming back to Juilliard at night to do our rep of plays, uh, classic plays, contemporary plays at night. And, uh, that crossover, it wasn't long, but it was insane to go from, you know, a soap to Shakespeare. I mean, I got to tell you, that's that's a pretty crazy day. Um, you were going from maybe some of the like most <laughs> inane, silly, fun writing uh, to some of the best writing ever. You know, uh, in the same day, and it was uh, two two very very different styles and everything. But um, yeah, and then I graduated, and then I was doing uh, the soap full time, and. Uh, it was good because I really, truly had no camera experience at Juilliard. We do, it is, it is a, it was, it was at that time, a theater training program, full-time theater. And so soaps were my camera class. I was, um, you know, I was being very bad on some national television show uh, and on all my children. And, but I, I was able to get better and better work on my craft, get better at camera work. And because you come out of Juilliard very theatrical because you were trained for the theater. So now yeah. you got to take all of that and, you know, get, put it on a laser focus to be in front of a camera lens. And that process takes time. And thank God that time was subsidized by ABC TV. Thank you, ABC TV. And I spent years uh, on all my children and then in and out of One Life to Live for three years. And by the time that process was over, I felt much more comfortable. And I, then I started working a lot in independent film and in primetime TV. Yeah. And think about this too, Matt. Um, what, a you know, I know it's soap operas and it's daytime and maybe you had had other aspirations, but you go to a soap where guess what? The actress on that, the leading actress on that soap was the number one leading actress in daytime and Susan Lucci. So you're going on a soap that's very popular, very successful. So I'm sure there had to be a little nerves in the beginning. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, the good thing was, I think I would have been more nervous jumping immediately to Broadway or to um, a big film where I'm playing next to a young Al Pacino or, or a younger or Dustin Hoffman. Um, I, I, you know, because soaps, um, I knew that it was a medium that I was never going to stay in for the rest of my career. But I, I didn't know most of the industry was not watching. We had huge fan base. All my children at that time was pulling like a 12. We had 12 yeah. million daily fans. There's not a show on television right now that gets better than a 10 or, yeah. or an eight. Most shows that are hugely successful now have 2 million watt viewers, 4 million viewers. It's insane. And here we were sitting with about half of America's televisions tuned in 
to watch Susan Lucci and to watch all my children. And it was incredible. But it was mostly housewives, you know, people that worked odd uh, hours. So I wasn't worried. If I wasn't good, it's not like the casting director at Universal Studios was watching all my children. Right. But okay, here's a great place for me to work on my craft. And the beauty of soaps is even if you're bad, the fans love you. Even if you're good, the, fan, yeah. it, the fans love the show. They love the writing. And you just are there to serve these crazy storylines that uh, it's funny. I've just recently been looking back on, on some of that. Um, uh, I was signing autographs at a Comic-Con recently and the, the fan gave me a book of all my children. And I forgot they did this hardbound book. It was a bestseller on the 25th anniversary of the show in 1994. Now, I had left the show in 90 or 91, um, right. but I was just flipping through, just going like a time capsule of looking at all the people that have been on the show, all the famous people, many people that were unknowns that went on to become stars, and just looking at all the crazy, ridiculous storylines, and I'm like, man, I kind of appreciate it now. It's just, it'd be fun to have a soap now uh, on primetime or even daytime that was just, they're so fun and silly so that you could totally get you know wink wink at the audience and have these absolutely ridiculous storylines that the, the the fans can get behind and I, I miss that I feel like everything everybody wants to win an Emmy now you know yeah. Breaking Bad, Sopranos, The Wire I'm like I think we're all taking ourselves too seriously like it would really love to see something staggeringly silly like that uh with those kind of characters again and one thing that uh was always uh funny about soaps is you could die about five times and still come back to life. Oh, that that's what I mean. It's sort of like this, <coughs> that, that quality of like, you know, twin coming back as your evil twin or, you know, all those storylines that they, like you said, I mean, they did aliens. They did no storyline was off the table. Nothing was too crazy. And I miss that. I feel like everybody's so safe now and everybody's trying to make really high quality. I'm like, you can make high quality and still in, in, let the audience enjoy themselves. And those audiences just loved. They would go to work. I mean, I can't tell you. I The beauty of soaps is everybody thought it was housewives. I got pulled over twice by two different cops. And they're like, oh, you want all my children? You know, can you sign the ticket? And then I won't even give it to you. And I was like, oh, my God. Because they worked on hours. I said, like, cops, yeah. They at that time, they used to rotate. So if you were working nights, you'd wake up at around noon, flip on the soaps, eat your breakfast, and then go to work at go 4 o'clock. And so, I mean, I, I met people all over the country. You also begin to realize the pull and I've, that I've never, ever kind of like gotten over. The 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 the, the reach of television uh, is amazing both. And I've had 35 years in this business. And so it's it just has been an opportunity to continually meet fans uh, all over the country, all over the world. And I never tire of it. People are like, oh, you must be so sick of this. We just love you on the show. It could be soap operas, it could be Sopranos, it could be Billions, Banshee, co commercials. I did 20 yeah. years, I did national commercials. Like, well, I always think about that. From, yeah, you're the Campbell yeah. Soup guy. I'm like, yeah, I'm the Campbell yeah. Soup guy. And let's be honest, Matt. I really believe soap operas inspired the comedy show Soap. If you think about it, it, it was kind of like a spoof on soap operas. Oh, yeah. And that was the classic show. So Soap, the comedy took you know they saw how outlandish sometimes soap operas could be and they used it to their advantage and they had a successful series so yeah. you know you never know who's really paying attention oh yeah and one of my favorite movies that is still just so silly and fun is soap dish yes um yeah. with kevin klein sally field yeah. elizabeth shu it's just great and i my, i got my equity card which is the union for theater my first theater job so again we're talking about soaps daytime nighttime so then I get out of Juilliard. I then go and do the all my children. My first theater job is a play called Quiet on the Set, which is a spoof of daytime, of daytime TV, written by Terrell Anthony, who was on Guiding Light. So right. he is. So what he did is he created a cast of actors that were all on soaps, and he makes a play that is a spoof of soaps. We take it down to the Orpheum Theater, get rave reviews, and it was a blast. And I got my equity card. I uh, and and. It was so much fun to make fun of it. But then the fans would come and love it too because everybody's in on the joke. That's the fun thing with soaps is that everybody was in on the, the – everybody knew, yes, ridiculous storylines. Like I slept with your brother. I slept with your father. I've got, you know, 
your sister's baby inside me. It's like, wait a minute, what? My sister's baby? Like, it's yeah. just nuts. And and yet they, you buy it. You you go with it because every day we would just take your brain somewhere else for an hour, sometimes two hours if you followed all my children one night to live. One, uh, uh, I mean, my sisters used to watch the entire ABC lineup in the seventies. You know, it was all my children one life to live. General Hospital. General Hospital. Yeah. Boom. There, there they were from one to four, watching the whole lineup. And let's talk about One Life to Live a little bit, because I'm going to be honest with you. I was really liking the character, Nick Manzo. And I said, wow, he's a pretty good character. He's a little pompous, but I liked him. And then I'll tell you what, man, it threw me for a curve when uh, he was the dirty cop who was setting up Andy Vega. So just talk about those three years on One Life to Live, because you really played on that soap at a time where that soap was bringing in some new actors who became very popular. So that was a great three year run for you. Yeah, I mean those like those years in in the you know between all my children in the late eighties, early nineties, one life to live in the mid nineties. I mean, I got to work with so many cool people, so many people I, I you know that went on you know to, to Kelly Ripa and Nathan Fillion and all these people that went on to prime time and to do other stuff. Um, God, there was just a oh oh my God, was it Sarah Michelle Geller? I just realized. I yeah, thought, she played on All My Children. She I think was she was there just after me, but yeah. there was somebody on One Life to Live recently that I had forgotten I had worked with. And it's somebody that went on to become quite famous. I can't, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll remember it. Jessica um, Tuck, maybe? Or... Oh, who's Jessica. that? Yeah, no, no, Jessica. And then, and then um, of course, um, what's her Thomas. name? Um, oh, my God. Who was in uh, the Dumb and Dumber movie with. Um, with... Oh, Lauren Howley. She played Lauren, on All My Lauren Children. Lauren was on All My Children yeah. with me at the time. Yeah. Um, but no, somebody else from One Life to Live, and I'm gonna remember it. Oh, uh, who's the girl that, uh, uh, from uh, the the TV show Nashville? Um, oh God, yeah, uh, uh, I know who you're talking about too. And I'm drawing God. a blank, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll remember it. Yeah, she was there. She was there when I was there, uh, and there was again somebody else. But those years in One Life to Live, again, so many, so much good writing, so much fun, and really the best part of the whole thing is I got to work with Bob Woods for you know, on and off for three years. Yeah, great after. Cool. Yeah, and what was great with my One Life gig is it was recurring. So I wasn't on contract. Recurring is a great situation. It means you can go off, do other stuff, come back. So I'd go off and do like a, a play somewhere uh, and uh, Atlanta, Philadelphia, come back. They'd have me on the show for two months working on a case. That storyline would finish. I'd go off and do an independent film, come back. So for two or three years, it was great because I just was an interloper. I was coming into the show, leaving. I never felt tied down. Um, but uh, but most of that, a lot of it was with Bob. And oh my God, he's got my sense of humor. Such a good actor, such a good guy, such a great man. Uh, and I just loved, loved working with him. Um, and truly one of my favorite, favorite people of all my years, 35 years, one of my favorite people to work with. Just a class act, Vietnam veteran, uh, charity, did tons of charity. Yeah. Uh, uh, just so consistent on the show and never took himself or any of it that seriously. And those are my favorite people that I, 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 I always tell people, I take my job incredibly seriously and not seriously at all because I'm not curing cancer. I know what we're doing here. We're entertaining people, but, yeah. but there's no reason to not take it seriously and do a really, really good job with what you're doing. And um, yeah, the soaps were just, like I said, man, it really was my home for so long. Uh, even I went over to as the world turns for about, I don't know how many months yeah. uh, playing a bad guy over there. It was just so much fun. I played my, my character in As World Turns was ridiculous. I was like an Italian bad guy living in Malta. They built an entire set of Malta that was yeah. so cool. And and I had the worst accent maybe in the history of, of which is weird because I do good accents. But holy crap, I, I sounded like I was a Scottish, you know, uh, Mexican. It was just the weirdest bad accent ever. And I was supposed to be Maltese or like Italian. Eh, yeah. eh. Oh my God. Um, so, so much fun, man. I, I really, I could talk about the soaps all day and it's been fun to kind of really revisit them because I've been doing cameos as well, uh, which is online. And if people that want autographs or uh, video messages, they reach out to me on cameo and I do them. Could be a birthday message for their mother, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But some of them are soap fans and it's been fun. And I'm like, oh my God. I because 90% of it's sopranos, but when somebody says, I loved you on One Life to Live, can you my mother did? Can you do a message for them? Like, I the soap fans, absolutely. Those were my first fans, and they'll stay with you to the end. Yeah, most definitely. And I think too, Matt, 
that that's the thing. Like you have some fans who know you from soaps. You have some fans who know you from Sopranos. You have fans who know you from Banshee, you know, uh, your pretty little face is going to hell. Yep, There's fans yep. that know you from that. So, I mean, like, that's the good thing about um, when you've done different things that you're not just, it's always great to be remembered for that one big thing. Like I think Sopranos will always be first, but these other things that you're remembered for, it just goes to show that, you know, you're making it in the business and that's the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, I've been, you know, I, I've been uh, very, very lucky to have just this very long and and uh, diverse career because it's truly, you know, between being a classically trained theater actor, going directly into, you know, five, six years in and out of the soap world and then going in deep into the independent film world, then going into the regional theater world, then going into Sopranos. And then going from Sopranos to Brotherhood, Banshee, Billions, uh, you know, uh, uh, Harry's Law, where I've occurred for a couple of seasons. I mean, I've just, it's been all, and that's LA, New York, you know, everywhere. And and, uh, and I'm not done. <laughs> yeah. At least I think I'm not, but um, miles to go before I sleep, as Robert Frost said. So still young at heart, still kind of, you know, make it a go of it and uh, still looking for that next kind of cool experience. You know, now I'm now doing a little bit of directing. Uh, yeah. and that's kind of create, uh, you know, uh, creating a whole new world of problems and, cr but uh, artistic outlet for me to just explore. So I'm, I'm having a blast. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so let's talk about Sopranos. Now, you initially um, auditioned for the part of Father Phil, correct? Correct. So what happened was um, you went to the audition, then the next day they asked you to um, audition as a lieutenant or agent Grasso, right? So, I mean, it wasn't agent Harris at first. No. So, so the, so the audition for father Phil was in the pilot yeah, uh, in season one. And, uh, I auditioned for the pilot, didn't get it. Um, and then they went off and made the pilot came back after the show had been picked up They're shooting season one. I was brought in to play agent, uh, to audition for agent Grasso. I did the audition, uh, Dave, and it was fine. David Chase was there, and he said, "Listen, uh, there's another character, Agent Harris. Could you come back tomorrow?" Um, which is great because very often they have you step out of the room, look at the other sides, and come right back in. But he gave yeah. me a night to go home, work on them, come back with those sides and those lines, and I did, and uh, and made enough of an impression to get hired as Agent Harris. I think they wanted Agent Grosso to really feel and look more Italian. Um, which and is, it kind of worked out for you, Matt, because totally he worked. really wasn't, he really wasn't in a lot of the show. He was in a few times after, but not like you were. So, yeah, that was the best thing that ever happened was him asking me to do Harris because yeah, uh, Grasso sort of, you know, came and went, but Harris became a mainstay, uh, for all six, seven, seasons. seven seasons. I yeah. know I, you're, you're obviously knowledgeable to know that it was seven. They will remember. Yeah, I never liked that. It was part two, six, a six B. I mean, they did yeah. that for contractual reasons. If that was officially a season seven, all the contracts would have had been redone and people would have yeah. gotten more money. But if they still called it season six, they were still under the umbrella yeah. of the early well, it's seven seasons. As far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I know. And I say that yeah. all the time. I'll say to people, oh, I was in all seven seasons. Like, but there was only six. I'm like, well, no, there wasn't. There was seven. There was six yeah. A and six B and six B. There was enough time off that that really is a second season. But um, yeah, and it 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 really. Uh, I was hired for one episode. Very often with recurring characters. I think sometimes. episode eight, you came in. Yeah, the first and very season. often when you're going to recur, they will imply that in your audition. Like it's one episode right now, but it looks like this character could come back. I'm trying to think. I think you came in two more that first. Season. I did. You I did. I did. Yeah, you, you definitely were in the season finale. Right. I, know that. I did the. I did the first up ep that episode on episode eight, and that was it. It was like one and done. And but like I don't think I'd finished in a week, and they called and said they want you to bring you back for another episode. So I think I did ten, twelve, and thirteen. Twelve, twelve, and thirteen, yeah. and then again, right back again, and that was shocking to me because I just really no one indicated that this character may be sticking around. You also have to remember. This was not a big deal to me because that show was had not even aired yet. Yeah, so I, you didn't know. I personally yeah. didn't think it was going to succeed. And it had nothing to do with the talent or the writing. I really liked it. And most of the things I like on television never last because it, it, it's really <laughs> good writing. It's incredibly good acting. And very often the things that succeed are so inane or so terrible that I'm just like, of course, that show's in season seven. 
and it's the worst thing ever. And a really, really good show that I liked had a one and done. So I, I truly, my wife kept asking, like, do you think it's good? I'm like, it's great, but I, I don't know if there's an audience for it. They're going to have to find that audience. It's really good writing. I also was a little narrow minded or, you know, I, I, it felt to me like Goodfellas, the TV show. But once I realized that it was a family drama, in the end, the reason the show succeeded is not because of the mafia. It was the Tony family. Tony Soprano is a suburban, and now that I'm a suburban New Jersey dad, everybody could connect with Tony with the wife, with the kids, with the money problems, with his job, with his life, with therapy, with women. It was all, he was a complicated, difficult man trying to get through his daily life and almost everybody could find themselves in that world. And then it's like, Oh, and PS, he's the head of the mob. He's head of the mafia. And that was just uh, so brilliant in its execution. But as I said, I, I remember going to the rap party of, uh, after the first season, I was kind of saying goodbye to people. I just did. I didn't know that the show was coming back. I had just been a small part of a big season, few episodes, really great. Thank you. I think it was at a pizza place. I'm not even kidding. Like, by season three, our rap party was at like, you know, the biggest space in New York City. That yeah. first season was at like John's Pizza or something like really, you know, pretty small, contained DJ pizza. See, it was great. And then it just by half, maybe. So then we shot season two and I think I did another three in season two. Yeah. And by uh, by the time that started airing is when things started getting out of control. That's when the show really exploded so by the time yeah. we came back for season three nobody could walk the streets i mean jimmy G james gandolfini was a rock star he's he's yeah. mick ja he's mick jagger he's he's elvis he's you know just he's huge i, I always kind of compare him to how carol connor was in the 70s on all in the family how popular he was because he was kind of you know the same way he was a he had good fam family values but he was you know a bigot and he was kind of a bad guy but people wanted to root for him. They wanted to see the, and that's how uh, James's character Tony was. I mean, people. I if I remember, didn't people used to come up to you and say, "You better leave Tony Soprano alone." I mean, oh yeah, I, yeah. I, get, I get spit on on the subway, and I'm not even exaggerating. Yeah, that people hated me. I was hated in the streets of New York because I was the guy trying to bring Tony Soprano down. And of course, I had to keep up just a television show, just a show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it it really it it was. Um, I said the reason the FBI, you know, I, that's why I lucked out because they bring me in for one episode, but they also realize they're going to have to maintain an FBI presence through the entire run of the show. We were there to remind people because Jimmy was so good. The character was so well written. People were being seduced into falling in love. I had so many women, female friends like, oh, my God, I love Tony Soprano. Like you, I was there to remind them that he was a sociopath, that he yeah. was a killer that he was a, a, a bad person because you were being seduced every week as an audience member into his, falling into his world and rooting for him. You're rooting for a killer. You're rooting bad guy, yeah. for the head of the mob. And it, we were there to every once in a while just kind of go, no, uh, hold on, he's a bad guy. And you can like the bad guy, that's fine. But you just have to remember, this is law and order. That's wrong. And meanwhile, you we in, in our daily lives, we root for law and order. But all of a right. sudden, on a TV show, we're all rooting for the bad guy, you know. And thank God, 9-11, uh, the only thing that positive that came out of that entire experience in that awful, awful day and, and, and the months that came to pass was the show had to change course. And uh, uh, we, we couldn't go back to writing The Sopranos. The, or I shouldn't say we. They couldn't go back to writing The Sopranos the same way because 9-11 had happened. And it changed New York. It changed the country, it changed the city, it changed New Jersey, it changed everyone's lives. And it, it in, in a weird way, it changed my trajectory as an actor because uh, Agent Harris went from being anti, uh, be, 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 uh, being organized crime to anti-terrorism. And yeah. they immediately shifted me, I think it was around season five. Season six, yeah, season six. Beginning yeah. of six, I become anti-terrorism and that changed everything. Because now the fans, I'm giving Tony Intel, uh, yeah. I am no longer bothering them. I'm showing up at the at the pork store, having a, a sandwich and just kind of giving them slight little indications of what's happening uh, in their world, intel from the FBI, and then looking for re reciprocity. So that relationship of me giving Tony information, him giving me information, 
means people don't spit on me anymore. Not only did they not spit on me, they love me. Because they're like, yeah. oh, my God, you were helping Tony at the end. We're going to win this thing. Like, yeah, Agent Harris. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, no. No, no. First four or five seasons, you hated me. You yeah. all hated me. It was clear that Agent Harris was sympathetic to Tony's plight. There's some great moments where, you know, my character's kind of shaking his head going, dude, you you, you got to get out of this or you got to change course. Yeah. But um, it wasn't until they really took me out and then I got Mike Kelly, just amazing actor, as my partner, season six and seven. Um, yeah. And who then went on to House of Cards and Emmys and all that stuff. Um, but we we had a great run there for a couple seasons, just bringing the show to a finish uh, in a great way. And the thing about your character too, Matt, is how like in the beginning it had a small role and how it evolved into like, so, and I always think about uh, season three because season three, the first episode, now the fans are waiting nine months for this show to come back. And it's really that first episode about the FBI trying to bug his house. You know, they're setting up a sting to try to put that, you know, yeah. that um, chip in his house. And it was basically mostly focused that first episode on you guys and you got to play like that that one episode where it revolved around you and your co-stars that were in the fbi on that show so again as i talk about 9 11 uh changing you know happenstance changing my career that was happenstance changing my career just before we were getting ready to, to shoot nancy marchand who played livia tony's mother died Passed away. quite suddenly yeah. Um, I mean, she had not been well, but like we fully expected to probably get her for at least one more season. Uh, her passing just before we started shooting uh, kind of uh, really left the writers, producers in a bit of a tailspin as to what to do. Because a big part of the show, I mean, David Chase admits like this was a show. If the, 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 the log line for this show was like mob boss who has a complicated relationship with his family mother. and his mother yeah. who's in therapy for all of that. And when you take the mother out of it, that changes everything. And in right. and, and her passing, I mean, first of all, she's just an amazing, amazing actress. Yeah. Um, and an amazing presence. And her passing affected uh, every, everything immediately because now we don't have that storyline. I think it was a gift to me um, uh, from the writers to finally give Agent Harris a chance to really i always say that episode episode 3.1 first episode of season three was my welcome to sopranos episode because up yeah. to that point i was an interloper i was just kind of like a presence more than i was a character and all of a sudden that episode that is entirely about the fbi entirely about with me as the head of that uh getting that lamp into the basement and all that stuff um changed my trajectory on the show didn't mean that there was a ton more episodes for me but it meant i was now really really i that with after that i felt i was truly part of the show i had my own soundtrack my god they built that into yeah. really cool peter gunn theme mashup with sting yeah that, that was great became like the fbi sort of cool soundtrack and i was like oh my god um and and i just that that i from that moment on i felt i'm on the show i'm on the show i i i it didn't it didn't really take off for me writing wise till around season six but it was still enough that they kept me around i always i was never there less than two or three episodes a season by episode six it was like i think five or six and yeah. season seven it was a lot so i i just you know nancy's passing was devastating and it, it but it opened a door for me to kind of get um uh myself established on the show yeah and think about this um matt is the relationship that agent Harris had with Tony now publicly, Tony had to like, try to, you know, maintain his uh, power with his uh, other crew. So he would kind of be a jerk to agent Harris in public, but privately he was a different person to agent Harris. He did not treat him like, you know, a jerk when it was privately, because I yeah. think deep down too, Tony knew that he may need this guy to help him someday. Not what happened with Phil Leotardo, but I mean, if Tony ever got indicted, Yes. You know, the last thing you want to do is just like give these guys, give the FBI any more ammunition to want to, you know, do whatever they can to put you away. So I think Tony knew he had to kind of, you know, treat him a little bit with kick gloves. And he didn't always do it publicly, but he definitely did it privately. Yeah, he, th there's a great scene. Um, I was talking about the scene the other day. It's one of my favorite as an actor. Um, and I'm trying to think what season it's either 6A or 6B, as, as you and I will reference them. Um, 
I meet him at an air at Teterboro Airport in the middle of a snowstorm, which was real. The snow that was, was the final big. episode. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is is it's the final one? Yeah, that's the final one where he goes in the car and his wife calls him. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So yeah, yeah, yeah that so was the last it, episode. I didn't realize that was the very last episode. I thought it was back a few. But he comes to me for information about Phil Leotardo, and which I do, of course, eventually give him famously yeah. at the end. Damn, we're going to win this thing. Um, but uh, he gets in the car and we're talking. And then I, my cell phone rings and I'm like, hold on. And it's my wife. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, babe. OK, just leave it on the counter. I'll heat it up when I get home. I don't know. Did she do her homework? Yeah, I don't know. It's something like that. It's it's inane suburban father banter with his wife yeah now, I've, I've done it a million times every guy i know has done it a million times checking in a little bit everyone's it's late in the day everyone's short what time are you going to be home i don't know your daughter's missing you i'm sure she is i'm working and i say honey i'm working i'm working okay yeah i'll, I'll let you know when i'm on my way i hang up and the look on jim's face uh, uh, uh tony's face of like man i've been there done that and i'm still there doing it is what i loved is that these two guys are two sides of the same coin. That's kind of what happened with Agent Harris and Tony Sopranos. We became two sides of the same coin, heads, tails, because it, it reminded me of the Warner Brothers cartoon when like the coyote, the do the sheepdog was chasing the coyote, the coyote was shaping, uh, you know, running away from the sheepdog. They both punched the clock. Um, it, it, it really is, was became this kind of like symbiotic. We're both in the same boat. We're tired, we work hard. We have families. We're just trying to get through our lives. And I love him watching me on my cell phone with my wife. And then I hang up and just the sympathy in his eyes. And then we have a, we finish the conversation. He gets out. It's so great. And what was amazing is the snow that was coming down was real. Yeah. And it was a great night. I sat in that car over and over many takes with Jim. And it was awesome. It was just one of my favorite uh, scenes in the show. And one of my, uh, one of my favorite moments uh, fi finishing up the show. And my favorite moment of Agent Harris, and it's that same episode. And in real life, it wouldn't be a favorite because you realize both guys are doing something bad. But it was the fact that when he calls Tony to tell him that, you know, Phil Leotardo's used a pay phone a couple gas times. Gas station. Gas station. Yeah, yep. The gas station. The thing that I loved about that scene is when Tony says thank you to Agent Harris, he genuinely means it. This time he means it. He's not just being, he really appreciated the fact that he called him. And I, you know, I just was happy that Tony finally respected Agent Harris because that was one thing that always bothered me about Tony is how he treated Agent Harris sometimes because I thought like it was unnecessary. So I was glad that they had that moment yeah. in that scene. Well, even, I mean, you have to remember also, there was like, even when I, when I went to anti-terrorism, one of the first episodes I come back and I'm sick. I've got yeah, like, I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I have a, I have a bug cause I spent some time over in the middle East and the rest of the gang is far more like Christopher is like, I hope his fucking asshole rots out. Yeah. You know, th they were far more like negative towards me than Tony. Um, not that Tony was supporting me in any capacity, but the rest of them, the rest of the guys were like, screw him. Don't, yeah. don't, you know, no sympathy, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was such a, it, listen, it was a very, and, and so much of my FBI work on the show without giving it too much intel was, was vetted by some people that, uh, made it, made sure that what we did on the show was real, authentic, and, and very driven by, uh, the reality of, of the FBI, both organized crime and anti-terrorism. And, um, so much so that my, my line that famous line that people say to me all the time, we're going to win this. Gonna win this that game. came from an actual FBI case. If you Google it, you'll find references into the newspapers. I can't remember the guy's name, but that was literally one, an agent that was on trial. And he had said that, had been recorded on tape saying that. And we used that line in the show. Right. And you got to work a scene with Michael because mainly you worked with Jim. Yeah. most of the series but you did get to do and jim and frank pellegrino you mainly worked with them but yeah. you got to work that one scene with michael where michael's being obnoxious and it's funny you just say something sometimes less is more you basically just kind of you know kill him with kindness and you shut him right up like he walks away so it had to be nice when you could work with the other cast members as well when you got that opportunity oh yeah because so often the fans think like oh you guys are all best friends i'm like you can go whole seasons if you don't work 
you know, like Edie, I worked with a little bit early on, but then, you know, thank God we were friendly and we had so many friends in common. Uh, but I could go whole seasons and never see her until the rap party. Yeah. Um, and it was it, 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 so really Drea DiMatteo, Jimmy, a little bit with Michael. Um, um, God, who else? I mean, other yeah, Frank Pellick, all the FBI agents. Yeah. But really, my my storylines were always so specific um, that I, I was never, you know, there was 90 percent of the characters on the show. I never even saw them. I never even yeah. saw them on set because. You know, you are you are brought in for your day of work, and very often it's scheduled with just the people uh, that are doing your scene. And unless you overlap for about twenty minutes, where you're finishing yours and they're starting theirs, as I said, you could go six, nine, twelve months not see people. And I, I imagine I I remember seeing the Game of Thrones cast at a uh, an event, and I thought those people don't even know each other. We're all sitting here going like, oh my god, they all must be best friends. It's like no, the Westeros crowds have no. The, the King of the North, like, I mean, those whole storylines, whole yeah. seasons where those, those storylines don't cross. I said, those people have never spent time together. That that event is probably the first time that they're all together, sharing stories, talking about the show, getting yeah. to know each other, because there was so much uh, delineation of storylines there that, like, whole seasons went by where you were up, you know, that you were in, they were in Iceland, I had friends that directed for the show, Iceland, Monica, you know, uh, Morocco, you know, they were all separated in very, very uh, sp uh, Northern Ireland, very specific ways uh, with the storyline. So they just never saw each other. Right, exactly. So two scenes I wanted to get your feeling on what, because, you know, with David Chase, you could never tell what he's thinking. But the two scenes that stand out to me that I think about um, with Agent Harris, um, the first scene is when they realize Adriana has been, you know, knocked off by Tony and his crew. And they're all like saying, you know, she could have ran, but they know deep down he, they got him. I always wondered, are they more upset that they lost their like lead person who was helping them build a case against them? Or do they, uh, what I think really happened was they feel somewhat indirectly responsible for her getting killed. What would you think they were thinking in that scene when they're kind of looking at each other and they seem kind of depressed? I think they felt like, oh my God, we got this girl killed. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's interesting because, you know, I always make that joke all the time because I said, you know, the FBI on The Sopranos, we were the Keystone cops. We didn't make one damn arrest that stuck and all we did was get a lot of people killed. We got Big Pussy killed. We got Adriana killed. You know, anytime, anytime it was revealed that somebody was, you know, off to, had been uh, connected to the feds, their, their days were numbered. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's a complex situation because you're trying to do your job. I, I, the organized crime thing, I, I have to imagine for the, many of those guys was very difficult because you're walking a fine line between, between trying to get information, trying to get them to come in, but knowing full well, there is no middle ground with, the mafia you you either have been touched and your damaged goods or you've never you've avoided getting any making any contact with the feds um in fact it's funny because a, a fan came up to me recently and he said i thought it would have been really cool he said if, if there was a season eight let's say tony had lived let's say we take away the whole uh holston's storyline of like yeah ice cream shop you know did he did he or didn't he get killed he said, if we come back for a season eight or seven, as you want to call it, he said, I thought it'd be really cool if AJ gets busted because AJ was already pretty troubled by the end of season seven. Yeah. Um, if he got arrested for like selling heroin on a college campus or like in Jersey city or something. And the feds are like, look, your son can do serious jail time or you can cooperate. And Tony's literally torn between bringing the entire mob down or protecting his son. So yeah. he can, and I thought that's a great storyline where it is, that's yeah. every, every good, every good mob theme is Shakespearean because it's about loyalty. And do you literally, I mean, well, you also have to remember, like, look at Tony at the end of the, of the show with Christopher, he killed his own nephew. Yeah. You know, he made sure he was dead and gone because he was complicated and troubled and taking everybody else down. And it's like, and I thought, yeah, that's a real, it's one thing for your, your cousin, your nephew. But I mean, I'm like, if it's your own son, and he's busted selling heroin, and the feds are like, look, we're going to take your son down unless you come and cooperate with us on your stuff. And I was like, damn, that's a good storyline. That really and, is. Yeah. And I never and I, even I, thought about that. Me neither. I never yeah. just because AJ was, you know, he was troubled. 
and he easily could have gotten himself caught up in some really bad shit. Um, but yeah, it's it's the whole you know all of that stuff with the feds. All, all I can tell you with all that stuff is multiple agents have come up to me. Guys on the job have said to me, you know, kind of whispering in my ear, like, "Hey, man, love the show, and I love love what you did. It was you, you got it, you got it just right, you got it just right." So whatever we were doing with our storyline, we we did it with conviction. We did it. We made sure it was vetted by people that have been in those situations and. Uh, cause so often I'm sure like many doctors will watch, you know, ER or a medical drama and be like, Oh dear God, that is nothing like my job. I'm sure they firemen watch Chicago fire and go, Oh dear God, that is not my job. But to have federal agents, FBI agents, you know, people, people that work, uh, organized crime, anti-terrorism, watch the show and go spot on. Well done. Well done. Because what we didn't do was sensationalize it. And that's what I loved. No. We just kept yeah. it very. It was almost best. like real life. That's what I yeah. always looked at. He said one of the best things we ever did was the stakeout. Because he said, you know what you did in the stakeout? You made it boring. It's boring as shit sitting yeah. watching a house for 24 hours. He said, there's nothing exciting. You're drinking coffee. You're barely awake. And you kind of capture that that tediousness of the whole situation. You know, so that that I, I give David and the writers, obviously, a lot of credit for that. Because we just never made the fbi we never made it like a procedural ever in fact what i'm again one of my now that i'm a suburban guy like there's a great scene where the feds are looking at the footage of his house and they're looking at his water heater and they have a whole discussion about yeah. water heaters and i'm like that's exactly the shit that we talk about out here in the suburbs you're yeah. like oh how, how, how many gallons what's your capacity oh yeah and i've got a leak on mine oh my god i i, I think i can fix a leak but maybe not who's your guy you got a new because i think i might have to get a new one and I love that they're all looking at this surveillance footage, which on a procedural would be like, doom, doom, doom. And instead, it's like six guys and a girl staring at this terrible video going, yeah, that's a shitty water heater. Like, <laughs> I love that. I love that. I'm like, that's exactly. And then they said he's got about five years. Yeah. I mean, that and then it goes. Is like, it's brilliant yeah. writing. It's it's just like you go at something and take a left and you never sensationalize it. You you stay even that like they didn't sensationalize the mob. They made the mob a very complicated, convoluted, awful, you know, place that that, that is difficult for those that are in it to continue to succeed because it's just it. the world was changing. Also, that's what was crazy is the world was changing for the mob, for Tony. I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, the remnants of the New York Italian mob, what they're trafficking in at this point, because so many of those storylines, you know, things were changing. Everything went virtual. Money was money is now exchanged on the online. You know, the, the idea of an envelope of money is probably pretty limited at this point. Yeah. And you you got to be proud about this, Matt. I was thinking about this, too. We were talking about the parasite and stuff, and it made me think about this. We wait two years for season six to come because they went on a two year hiatus. They yep. filmed in May of 04 or showed the last episode and then it didn't come back till March of 06. Who's the first person we see when the show opens up? Agent Harris. He's throwing up, you know, you get so right there. You have to be proud because you know that you're like part of the core. And then, like I said, it's no disrespect to the other agents, but the only agent that we still saw in season six and seven was uh, Agent Harris. The rest of them, I think we saw one the last episode, but it was just them watching, um, you know, Bobby Bacala's funeral. Otherwise, you're the only one we see. So they that had to say a lot about you as an actor and what they thought about your character because it was the only one that was there, one through seven. Yeah, I mean, I, believe me, I, I, as I said, in fact, <laughs> that throw-up moment, that was, uh, I, that was a rig. There was literally such a thing as a throw-up rig, which is a tube taped to the side of your face. They shoot you from the side that the tube's not on. And they literally will have a suction thing. They're like action, shrimp, and you're just spitting, you know, the stuff you just have your mouth up. And it was, and it was many, many take, like the first take, it looked comical. Cause it was so, it was like projectile vomiting. So then we cut it back. We tried again. And then just like a little bit came out. They're like, okay, can we split the difference? But it's just multiple takes and the smell of this mix of what they do it's kind of like oatmeal mixed with um, gravy mixed. It's just awful, and it but it yeah. totally looks and feels like throw up. You're like, oh Jesus! Uh, but many, many takes. But yeah, believe me, man. I I I, I honestly um, I was grateful for that ride. I was an interloper. I 
I always felt like I was part of the cast uh, just enough, just enough to win a SAG award in season seven. Yeah. Um, and as part of the cast, that meant the world to me that, that I was part of Yeah, that. And you went up on stage with them. Yeah. Thought yeah. That was, awesome. that was incredible. And that was so cool. And, um, because as I said, I, when I, even when I see them to this day, I have such respect for the core of the show because I still feel like I was always an outsider, but they've, they always made me feel like I was part of the show and part of the family, even though my character was so on the outside of that world, you know? Yeah. Now, Matt, how did you enjoy Banshee was a, you know, very crazy. You talk about Sopranos being violent. Ban Banshee was as violent as a guy. And, you know, what a storyline. This guy takes on the role of pretending to be the sheriff. And I mean, it, it, it was on four seasons, but I mean, that was a very popular show as well. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, that is one of those uh, when people say, oh, I just finished, you know, I binge watch Sopranos for the third time. What do I what am I watching next? I can't keep watching Sopranos. I'm like Banshee. I'm like, really? I'm like Banshee. It It's like Quentin Tarantino made a TV show. I said, it's sexy. It's violent. It's weird. It's it's sick. It's it's exciting. I said, and, and what I loved, again, at a time when everybody was trying to win an Emmy, we were just trying to give you a, a popcorn movie, action movie type thrill ride on a, on a Sunday night, you know, or Saturday night. We were just trying to make you kind of turn off your brain for an hour and have a blast. And that's what we did. And everybody, that, the fans of that show, it's a cult. They absolutely like, Sopranos fans are, you know, they're, they're very, you know, they're many, but the Banshee fans, like, they come up to me like, oh my God banshee man oh my god i got into that like yeah. nobody knew about the show my wife and i started watching it we couldn't stop it was like a train wreck and like you're just watching like oh my god what's gonna happen next and believe me i, I tell them i said if you think it was fun to fun to watch imagine making that show car crashes explosions sex scenes gun shootouts huge gun shootouts crazy amish mafia skinheads American Indians, Native Americans, uh, uh, you know, just so many polit politics. Every, but there were so many storylines that were uh, crazy. Drug dealers, you know, coming in from Colombia and, oh my, uh, cross-dressing, you know, who, uh, Job, the cross-dressing uh, crazy dude. I mean, it's like so much fun, so much fun. And I had a blast and I, I the fans, I, I have such a great connection with them because that quietly was just, one of my favorite experiences ever as an actor, much different than, than agent Harris. Cause I was a series regular. I was part of the fabric of the show and my character grew and grew and became more involved in every storyline. And your character right away knows this something's not right with this guy. He could just tell by, he said, this isn't no ordinary cop. Like he knew something wasn't right and he right. figured it out early on. Yeah. And by the end, I'm the sheriff. And it was like, that was four years. In a weird way, you kind of watched the show through Brock's eyes because Brock was the only normal person. I yeah. mean, everybody else seems incredibly violent, crazy, strange, you know, this and that. And in the end, I was kind of the most sort of grounded character on the show and and uh, bringing it all the way full circle to me getting my wish. Yeah. Uh, but it was, uh, yeah, man, I, I just, I really, really love doing that show. And if there's anybody listening, like, you're looking for something that's just different and and a wild ride. Like as I said, we are going to we are there to entertain you every episode, and it's it's now, just was, was it the uh, crew's plan to end it after four seasons? Uh, I mean, so that... so yeah, Jonathan Tropper, our head writer, said to us because there was obviously material for a fifth season. He said every show he ever loved in the eighties, nineties. He said went two seasons too long. And he said, and I always promised myself if I got a show on the air and I got it to a great place, I would pull the plug. Yeah. And it's funny because I just saw an interview with Jerry Seinfeld and he talked about Seinfeld, not that we were anywhere near Seinfeld, but he said, uh, the interview, I think it might've been uh, Howard Stern. He says, so you, let me get this straight. You were offered a hundred, hundred and fifty million dollars to come back and do a 10th season. And Jerry says, I could have got more. He probably could have got 200, 250, a quarter of a billion dollars to come yeah. back and do an 11th season uh, from the head of Universal. I think it was Universal, NBC Universal. And uh, and Jerry said no. And he said, and Howard's like, I'm incredulous. Come on. I mean, that's ridiculous money. Why? why? And he goes, for one year, for that one season, for that money, I ruined the entire show. We right. were at the top of our game. 
We are, you know, the, the audience is right with us. They love everything we're doing. We have not, uh, uh, the, the quality of the show has not gone down for 10 years. We're finishing, you know, and we, we've got, if we, if we come back for one more year, it's cynical, it's a money grab, it's going to reek, and, and the audience is going to be so judgmental. And he, and, and he said, you go watch a stand-up do his act. If he's hysterical for an hour, and the last 20 minutes he kind of falls apart, all you're going to remember the next day when they say, oh, you went and saw some uh, comedy last night. How was it? It's like, eh, wasn't that good? Even though the guy killed it for an hour. Yeah. But if you ruin it in the last 15 minutes, you're done. You're done. And I think that was the same with Banshee. It's like there were storylines. There was obviously content, things we could have done. But Jonathan just said, let's let's go. Let's go. We had a great four-year run. The premise was insane. You, you, it was it, The premise was straining credulity i mean you were literally just going could this really in this digital age of phones and computers could this guy still be hiding his identity and you had to kind of go no this has been perfect crazy crazy four-year run and then it was like a a, a tornado of storylines and craziness and then it spins out of town and it's like it never happened and i'm like i was upset because clearly brock was still very much alive and still very involved at the end of season four but he was right. I'm like, you know, I, I had, I could think of 10 storylines for season five, but none of them were great. None of them were great. And we had had some great storylines and I'm like, yeah, probably time to shut up shop. And everybody moved on. So much of the cast has been so successful in other places. Jonathan has some great shows out there. Uh, Warrior over still on Cinemax uh, uh, and on what is now called Max on HBO. And then um, C over on Apple TV. So he's with uh, uh, Momoa. Um, he's he's Jason Momo. He's he's just been doing great. He's best yeah. best writer in Hollywood, and he's uh, still still killing it. Yeah, you know, and it seems like every character you played, fans always got a surprise. Like when they thought they knew what the character was about, it was always different. And I think a, your pretty uh, face is going to hell because we think you're the Satan for the first two seasons. And then we realized, no, you're not. You're some guy named Darren Farley. And I was just like, boy, that threw me for a curve. So, I mean, that was what I always enjoyed about any part you played is when I thought I knew the character well. Like, I really thought the first two seasons of Sopranos, you were out to get, your character was out to get Tony. Then you realize he helps Tony in the end. So, like, it, I was always shocked no matter what, whenever it came to the characters you played. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been lucky. I've had some great twists. And I think... It's what's fun is if you stick around long enough, it's because all the shows you're mentioning were shows that I was on for more than one season. You know, yeah. when you're in it, <laughs> excuse me, Bless you. Yeah. when we're in it, thank you. When we're in a when you're in a show for one season, it's hard to kind of get a sense of the actor, of the human being. But when you stick around long enough, seven seasons on Sopranos, four seasons on Banshee, uh, three seasons on Brotherhood, uh, four seasons on Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell it gives the writers enough time to get to know you yeah. and it's great because i said like you know the twist and changes on agent harris some yeah a lot of that was circumstantial but also it was them getting to know me a little bit and i'm far more of a sympathetic kind of guy than i am a kind of asshole cop and it was the same thing on banshee like eventually you know my character was so kind of like by the book and everything and by season three they i grew a beard like they changed everything about brock and in the yeah. end, so much more Matt Servito came through in the role. And not that I want the role to come to me. I like to go at the role as an actor. But they begin to use your qualities in the writing. And that's happened with me on multiple shows. And I've been so lucky because it's like that's when you get to that point where they're turning the writing in towards who you are as a human being and what you kind of portray on camera, you're, you're so lucky. There, that has to come from longevity. Because like I said, one or two episodes, they don't have the time. One season, they don't have the time. Multiple seasons, they begin to listen to your the notes that you're giving about the writing, the voice of the character, you know, and they realize, oh, you know this character, you are this character, and they've been, you know, right. Not that, not that the guys that did the Hell Show, uh, you know, it's like we're thinking you are Satan. That 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 twist in that storyline was absolutely all them. That was those sons of bitches kind of twisting it for me saying we had this crazy idea where maybe you're not the real Satan. You're just sort of like yeah. <laughs> Satan number 32. Like there is just a long line of guys in line for the role of Satan who just work in the corporate world of hell. I'm like, oh my God, you sons of bitches. 
So that twist was great. I, yeah, I that was that. a great, great show. And oh my god! I, I really thought that could have continued, but you know, yeah, we're, like uh, you just said, by, the, by the way, we're out there on um, on. If you go to YouTube, uh, we made a series during COVID of uh, short little uh, animated vignettes of the show. We couldn't get together and do the show anymore because of COVID and the network yeah. was moving on. But uh, Dave Willis and Chris Kelly created a series of short animation, and it's all the same guys voicing the characters. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, oh, we had a blast, and they're, I, I believe they're on YouTube. Um, and the, the 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 original show is still on Hulu. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, I, I'll definitely check that out. So, two final questions before yes, we go. Number one, um, what could we look forward to seeing Matt Servito in the next uh, six months or so? And Number two, what's been the most rewarding thing about your career? Um, so, uh, yeah, most recently I just finished up season seven on Billions. Um, yeah. But we didn't even get into that. I've been recurring over there for six seasons since, Jesus, since season two, uh, yeah. all the way to season seven. Um, not as many episodes as I usually do with a recurring role, sometimes just one or two. Sometimes last year I think I had six. Um, but that's been a blast. And I, I love Paul Giamatti. We got to work together. We've known each other for years. Um, so that the final, final season of Billions has finished um, just just before the writer's strike. And uh, those those episodes will be airing, I believe, this fall. And how um, many episodes are you in for that uh, season? This, this season, just one. Um, just, just one, one. yeah. Uh, just, I think they kind of brought almost everybody back for a bit of a curtain call. Uh, right. Many, many characters, which I, I, I could name names, but characters that had a, you know a, appeared and gone away during the run, the seven-year run of the show. Many of them were brought back for cameos in the last uh, season, so it was great, and including uh, Governor uh, Buffalo Bob Sweeney. So yeah. I had it's such a blast on that. So I finished that, and then I did a movie with uh, De Niro. Um, oh, that in, had to be an honor. It was yeah. a blast. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're a New York actor, your bucket list includes film with Robert De Niro. So uh, I got to spend six weeks with Bob in Cincinnati doing a movie that was originally called The Wise Guys, I believe. The official name has changed to the Alto Knights. I hope I'm not getting in trouble by talking about this, but I believe it's going to be called the Alto Knights. Should be out at Christmas. Uh, another great De Niro mob story, true story about Frank Costello in New York in the 40s and 50s. I play his lawyer, a cast of thousands, amazing uh, people, and Barry Levinson, directing, great director of so many wonderful films uh, that you know and love. And uh, yeah, what a treat. So that's coming out. Uh, but in the interim, you know, things, <laughs> as I can say on your podcast, things are slow because we are on strike. The writers are on yeah. strike. The actors are on strike. So uh, I'm going to go back and do some more directing. Uh, some of that, some of the, my projects are allowed to proceed because they're independent. They're not connected to any major uh, producing studio. So um, just going to keep busy. But uh, those, those were, those are the most recent things. And then um, what was the question? Like, what was the most rewarding What's been the most, I know it's hard to pick one, but if you had to pick one thing, what has been the thing that you, you know, would say has been most invaluable to you in your career? Um, hmm. You know, I grew up in Detroit in a time, you know, in the 60s and 70s, everybody worked for a living. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm hyper aware because of that upbringing, uh, you know, of seeing guys go off to factory jobs every day. Many, many of my friends or dads had factory jobs. Um, I, I know I don't quote work for a living because like the, the, the kind of stuff that those guys and gals did was um, menial manual labor, broke their back, um, uh, broke their spirit, but they made good money. And, you know, uh, and the, the city was built on there. The Detroit was built on the backs of so many hardworking immigrants and everything. But so it's so as I went off into my crazy, you know, sort of frou-frou business. Uh, in New York, leaving Detroit, because you were asking me, I'm like, I never envisioned myself being an actor. I mean, I didn't necessarily see myself kind of working in a factory, but I sure as hell didn't know what the hell I was going to do. But the idea that I kind of, this has all been, there's a great movie called Being There with Peter Sellers. I feel like my career is being there. Like he just, he he's a great character because he just keeps falling into these amazing situations without any uh, gumption. He, he, he He's not like he's going after things. Things keep happening to him. And I just feel like I, I'm so lucky because I fell into this job and I just didn't just fall into it. I fell into one of the greatest, you know, actor training programs in the country. I fell into like one of the best soap operas ever. I fell into one of the best TV shows ever. Uh, and I just keep being Peter Sellers and being there that I just keep finding myself in these amazing situations. I mean, I guess 
you know, at some point you have to acknowledge your talent kind of bringing you to those places. But man, I, I just, the ride isn't over and I just keep finding uh, more great situations to be in, but it's the people, man. I, I, I try doing things alone, like writing music. You, you, I love to collaborate and the people I've got to meet and work with for 35 years. And I mean that the actors, but also the fans, man, I meet people everywhere I go that have seen every part of my career and they're so effusive and they're so fun to talk to. And the fans are what, I mean, you're not, you're doing it. I know it seems so cliche to say this, but you are, you're doing this for the fans. And just like today, talking to you, Mike, I mean, you're obviously a huge fan of these, many of the shows I've done. And it's, it's a blast because that they, they make me, they, they reaffirm everything I believe is like, we, we do these things, you watch them, you have a, you laugh, you cry, you, you cheer. And we're just, you know, during COVID, so many people said, I got through COVID by watching, binge watching Banshee, binge watching Sopranos, binge watching Billions, watching your crazy, your pretty face is going to hell show and laughing. You made me laugh, you know, so you just have to remember that's what we're doing. And, and you're like, wow, um, I, I feel like we, we can really take for granted artists, actors, musicians, but in those days when you just kind of need to get through some time a song, a TV show, a movie, a, a picture, a painting, a book, something like that gets you through. And um, I've just been part of some some great shows that have been meant a lot to a lot of people. Uh, that's awesome. That's a great answer. And Matt, I really appreciate you giving me a, a few minutes today. I really do. I mean, it's an honor for me. Been a big fan forever, going back as far as 1990. So for me to get to talk to you and meet you, it was a real uh, highlight for me. And I really do thank you for coming on today, but I also congratulate you on what has been an awesome career. And I applaud you for that. So thank you again for coming on. You bet, Mike. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the summer. I'm heading to the Jersey shore and going to take a little, little vacation and uh, I'm sure meet a lot more fans <laughs> <laughs> down, down at the beach. So uh, looking forward to meet, talking well, about it. You Let's definitely do- enjoy it. Thank you again, folks. There you have it. Like I said, I've been a fan of this gentleman since, 1990. I first saw him on a show called All My Children, which a lot of you know. Then I got to see him on One Life to Live. Then a few years went by and I really didn't see him in anything. And then a terrific show came out on HBO in 1999 and he resurfaced and boy, what an impact he made on the show, The Sopranos, or as he calls it, the show. And Agent Harris, to me, was one of the most important characters of that series. In the beginning, it was a small role, but if you watch the final season, you see the type of character Agent Harris plays and how important he was to Tony Soprano. And that's the brilliant acting of Matt Servito. He has done everything that uh, an actor could do and every part he's given and everything he does, he always hits a home run with everything he presents you and me and fans everywhere. You know, they talk about uh, success being an elevator. You must climb stair by stair. Well, it's safe to say that Matt Servito has reached the top. For In the Spotlight, I'm Mike Kenichi saying good night, everyone. All right.